Hi, my name is Nina Trivetti, and I'm going to be talking about my project, Lost Noise, Exclusions and Gaps in the Her Noise Archive, as part of the 2021 Decolonizing Archives Research Residency. And over here is just an image of four fanzines that I created as part of my research output. It's called Lost Noise. And I collaborated with a, a designer named Amir Hira, whose stage name is Hira, H-I-R-A. And this image is a snapshot I took on my phone in February 2020 when I visited the South London Gallery, where I saw an exhibition of archival material from the 2005 original iteration of the Her Noise exhibition. That exhibition looked at um, broadly women and music, women artists who worked with music in some capacity and or musicians. So this photo that I took at the time, um, I just noticed that it was a suggestion form and written on ink on the form is a note from musician Bishi Bacharya. And it says, anything ethnic, please reflect the world of women outside the Western Hemisphere, i.e. New York, London and Berlin. It's everywhere you go. Thank you, Bishi. The suggestion form is in itself a reflection on the archive or set of materials. It brings forth a doubling effect. And I think when I, when I refer back to this suggestion form, I often think about how it creates a space for critical engagement and analysis. Um, and I'm interested with my research in how sound archives can examine excluded histories. This is a snapshot from the her Noise Archives based at LCC. And these are additional suggestion forms. I noticed they were filled out by somebody that I know. So I interviewed that person as part of one of the fanzines that I created. And this is from the um, curators of the exhibition who at the time had created different lists and almost a mapping of different um, artists and musicians. And the physical and online archive that's preserved by the UAL Archives and Special Collections Center contains curatorial research like this. And in particular, I was really drawn to the material in the fanzine archive, which I'll refer to in just a moment. I'm interested in how the Hernoise archive is rooted in the institution and formed of a project based at institutions. So my initial starting point is to consider who is and is not included in the archive and what audiences are and are not reached. I find myself interested in this exclusion, in this gap of the archive, and the conditions that create and perpetuate those gaps. This is um, a snapshot that I took from one of my archive visits at LCC of some of the fanzines that are part of the large fanzine collection that's part of the wider Her Noise archive. So the online archive for Her Noise is noted by the online curator as, quote, a resource of collected materials investigating music and sound histories in relation to gender, bringing together a wide network of women artists who use sound as a medium. In particular, the site states, this online archive operates as a living archive and the content is regularly activated through student projects, research projects and events, contributions from invited guest curators, and artworks from the London College of Communications, MA Sound Art students, who have since 2011 made work in response to the archive." End quote. So therefore, I thought it was significant to consider what the living archive is and how it's been referred to. Um, and at this point, I started looking into the Living Archive Conference that was organized by the African and Asian Visual Artists Archive at Tate Britain in 1997. In the introduction to the Living Archive papers and third text, David Bailey and Sonia Boyce wrote, quote, the question was how to deal with issues of mainstream institutional archiving and collection policy from which the archival material of the African and Asian Visual Artists Archive was excluded." End quote. Bailey and Boyce outline the term living immediately suggests a friction, they said, or a tension with the past, or in this case, tradition. 
by utilizing Karen Barad's framework of how material is treated as active and ongoing in its own historicity and material becomings, we can also think about how else to define what a living archive is. I'm questioning whether the archival history presented in the Hernois archive can lead to ways that it might be expanded and become accessible beyond a limited scope. In the fall 2020 issue of October, titled A Questionnaire on Decolonization, respondent Stephen Nelson wrote a manifesto of sorts, or a collection of um, phrases that start with to decolonize means. Nelson's points about looking at places of learning other than institutions and thinking about the ways exclusions occur and how the institution can shield or foster smaller remits or parameters of networks privileged to those places has been impactful to how I perceive and think through archives in general. Nelson writes, quote, to decolonize means studying the historical avant-garde through the art and scholarship of women and authors of color. To decolonize means citing the work of women and authors of color when you don't have to. To decolonize means envisioning an audience far wider than your historically white institution of higher learning, museum, and art world. In effect, Nelson is bringing forward ideas here that are also relevant to forms of radical citation, something that I'll talk about in a moment. This is another image from um, the fanzine collection. And I'm interested in how fanzines in the Hernois archive look at or examine material histories, citation, and reference while acting as a site with the potential to explore gaps in the exclusions in an archive. So fanzines or fan magazines follow this DIY format and aesthetic. They rely on photocopied paper, riso printing, um, or cardstock. They're self-published and distributed. And the writing in zines revolves around personal narratives, self-reflections, cultural reflections, fandoms, reviews, or lists of culturally specific things. Historically, political pamphlets and fandoms amongst science fiction fan groups paved a way for how zines function contemporaneously. The Hernois Archive fanzine collection concentrates on UK and North American zines from the time period between 1990 and the early 2000s, with the zines focusing on music and in particular the Riot Girl movement. As part of the Hernois exhibition in 2005, there was a specific zine event featuring Toby Vale from the band Bikini Kill, Alison Wolfe from the band Bratmobile, and Amy Spencer, an author and researcher of zines. In the Hernois Archive, there's a small number of zines that refer to identity, race, or whiteness in music fandoms, as reflected by the experience of the writer of that particular zine. Queerness and queer music communities are more widely articulated in the archive. And important to note in the archive are zines such as Outpunch, Queer Core, A History of Zines, Forbidden Planet, and V Reject that broach topics surrounding race, gender, and queer culture. So in this way, there's a scope to continue researching zines as a space for marginalized voices, echoing the political origins of this format. And these are some additional images from the LCC um, archives of the different fanzines that I was looking at during the course of my research. Just to give you an idea of some of the, the aesthetics of the zines. Often, I come back to Saidiya Hartman's definition of her writing method of critical fabulation as the refusal to fill in the gaps and provide closure. The desire to provide closure is something I'm learning to let go of with archival research. My journey through the Hernois archive was about coming to terms with this, and I think there's scope here also to think through the impact of the fanzine archive and the tangential projects that occurred after the initial 2005 iteration of the Hernois exhibition. So moving forward, um, I wanted to engage with the archive through a framework referencing how Dylan Robinson writes about in inclusion and critical listening. So Robinson writes, quote, engaging in critical listening 
positionality involves a self-reflexive questioning of how race, class, gender, and sexuality, ability, and cultural background intersect and influence the way we're able to hear sound, music, and the world around us. And Robinson also considers ways to rethink inclusion as moving beyond representation. Um, and, and that is kind of an area of research that I think I'm continuing to look into. So for me, what's been really great about this project is that um, it brought forth a lot of like really active research that I feel has different strands that I can continue to, to think about and write about and, and examine. And I worked on a series of four fanzines. This is the cover of the first zine that I made um, with the help of designer Amir Hira. And it was titled Lost Noise. And I'll just go through a few images of the actual zines. This is what the layout of the first zine looks like. And the, the background is this kind of gray archival folder that's present in the archive. So, so that is definitely um, a part of kind of the, the aesthetic of all four zines. And the images are taken from different snapshots I took of the, the wider fanzine collection at the LCC archives. And this is taken from um, one of the magazines that's actually part of the fanzine archive called Shocking Pink. And Shocking Pink was formed or produced by the Shocking Pink Collectives between 1981 and 1992. And there was a specific design layout and different aesthetics that I think were really influential to the format of popular zines in the 1990s. So this magazine focused on London and wider UK politics and cultural critique. It also offered information and articles about self-care, healthcare, feminist activists or social groups and activism founded by and in support of women of color. And I think um, design wise, this is a really important, impactful um, layout and set of images that were that were used throughout. And I think it, like I said, really impacted wider zine culture and also kind of looking at some of the imagery, it really made me think of pamphlets and posters or materials from the Organization of Women of African and Asian Descent during the period of 1979 and into the 1980s. Those posters and pamphlets and materials of that particular group, the Organization of Women of African and Asian Descent, is available to view in the archives of the Black Cultural Archives as part of, um, it's based in Brixton. Yeah. just going through a couple of images of that layout of the first fanzine. And with the first fanzine, the contents, I organized it to have an introduction to the Hernoy's uh, exhibition in 2005 and the, the background of the exhibition and the curators and the artists that were part of it. And then the next section, I looked at the gaps and exclusions. Um, then I focused on shocking pink and some of those important design elements of that. And then I, I wrote about the, the fanzine archive itself. And this is the cover of the second issue of Lost Noise. And here you can see um, in the table of contents, one of the folders and the kind of aesthetic of the gray archival folder that I was trying to work with. And with this issue, there's a, a small introduction. There's a conversation that I had with someone who wrote suggestion forms for the 2005 exhibition, who I, I recognized. We talked about their um, recollection of the exhibition, and that was, that was really interesting to hear about that kind of recollection of the time period, of, of what exclusions were, or could, you know, how we can think of those exclusions now. And then this um, fanzine issue number two also looked at student-led responses and tangential projects. And then I, I also wrote about in this fan, fanzine um, how Saidiya Hartman and authors like Ocean Wong have influenced me as well. And that's the cover of the third issue of the fanzine. And in this fanzine, I looked at archival histories, citation practices, um, and some other kind of wider historical frameworks. And I also included a conversation that I had with Cecilia Wee who um, is a curator and um, 
and lecture and we talked about um, the exhibition um, and some of the other women artists and musicians around that time period that you know could have been part of part of the project but weren't included in it and this is one of the layouts in the zine um, which takes some images from Mindy Sue's uh, website which looks at the history of cyber feminism and I was really drawn to how Sarah Ahmed and Mindy Sue work with citation as a way to challenge how knowledge is produced and reproduced, unveiling this potential for um, how we can challenge hierarchies. Um, and Sarah Ahmed writes, citation is how we acknowledge our debt to those who came before, those who helped us find our way when the way was obscured because we deviated from the paths we were told to follow. And I think this sets the scene for how Ahmed grounds this type of citation practice as something that is imbricated in the production of addressing and offering knowledge about exclusions. And I'm really interested in how Mindy so works alongside and designs with citations. So the website that they've created is called Cyber Feminism Index, and it's an open access spreadsheet or resource list of projects and it decenters um, I think it decenters whiteness with its design. Right? So the index is an archive of cyber feminist sites and addresses the gaps in that kind of archive of sites and in the history of cyber feminism. So this index offers different non-hierarchical methods of navigation, echoing the ethos of inclusivity central to citational practice. Sue so notes that she wanted the index to offer a way to, quote, visualize citations, end quote. Sue so also comments, as you open entries, they're added to the side panel in a list that can be downloaded as a PDF. And I, I quite like that idea of kind of having this non-hierarchical space where you could look at things that have been excluded um, and kind of save copies of these lists and, and bibliographies almost. So so Sarah Ahmed and Mindy Sue's work has been really impactful to my research when I've been um, looking into radical citation. In that issue of the fanzine, I was also looking um, at a particular history that I came across when I listened to a series of podcasts called Blind Spot Tulsa Burning, which focused on the first black owned daily newspaper in the US, which was the Tulsa Star, and its founder and editor, A.J. Smitherman, who in 1917 wrote a telegram to the then governor of Oklahoma about the town of Dewey, in which the homes of 21 black citizens were destroyed by a white mob. Smitherman traveled to Dewey to report on the incident, and the narrator and researcher of the podcast called three different research centers to see if they had an issue of the Tulsa Star with information on that investigation, but none of the archives had that particular issue of the newspaper. The archivists and librarians said that the archive material was missing either from microfilm or from the archive itself. And the research of, researcher of this series noted, quote, this is a widespread thing. Accounts of racially motivated attacks literally snipped out of archives and libraries and universities and other collections. Like so many other stories about this period, we're just left with a gap in the record, end quote. And I think often of the term and the action of the snip, right, to slice out of the archive or of histories. And this action recalls ways in which writers have worked um, around and with and through archives in order to suture the SNP. Material storytelling is something author Saidia Hartman enacts with her use of critical fabulation, and author Ocean Wong enacts it with fiction writing. In Wong's On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous, the author quotes Kyu Miao Jin as part of the book, quote, but let me see if using these words as a little plot of land and my life as a cornerstone, I can build you a center, end quote. For me, this quotation offers an entry point into how Vuong approaches storytelling and world building. I think the writing of Ocean Vuong is aligned in some ways with author Saidiya Hartman in how both authors utilize fiction writing 
or narratives alongside historical writing or research. Notions of remembering and memory are also explicit in both authors' work. Vuong writes, in Vietnamese, the word for missing someone and remembering them is the same. He goes on to write, we go on to write, I miss you more than I remember you. And some of, the, some of that writing I thought was, was really impactful. Like I remember coming back to that kind of oscillation between missing and remembering. So I think aspects of Hartman's writing method of critical fabulation are involved with ideas surrounding missing and remembering, giving memory. This speculative form of fiction writing tells the stories of the people left out of the archive and is designed by Hartman as flattening the levels of narrative discourse and confusing narrator and speakers, illuminating the contested character of history, narrative event and fact to topple the hierarchy of discourse and to engulf authorized speech in the clash of voices. The outcome of this method is a recombinant narrative the double gesture can be described as straining against the limits of the archive to write a cultural history. Compellingly, Hartman says the refusal to fill in the gaps and provide closure is a requirement of this method. I think here of my need with my research to close gaps, like to fill them, to suture them, and I think of Hartman's ability to refuse this. This refusal is a lens, a method, an active status with which I'm trying to approach my archival research. Just a few more layouts from the conversation in the zine that I had with Cecilia Wee. We talked about Frank Chickens and a number of contemporary art spaces like 198 Contemporary Art and Learning Space in Brixton and the Bernie Grants Art Center. And this is the cover of the fourth and final issue of Lost Noise. I had a few um, excerpts from the book No Archive Will Restore You by Julieta Singh. And I had a discussion with Tanvir Ahmed, who is a researcher and a lecturer at CSM in the fashion program and a a PhD researcher who's about to finish her PhD. Um, and, and that conversation with Tanvir was really illuminating because we looked at Tanvir's own practice um, as a photographer and as a researcher. And we talked about um, this idea of gaps and exclusions in detail as it relates to, to a lot of her research. And that's just, again, the layout of the four, four issues. Um, Thank you very much for listening.